This is the Phoenix Zoo most of us are familiar with. But this, too, is the zoo. It's all part of the Phoenix Zoo's commitment to conservation, which started soon after it opened its doors in 1962. That's when the zoo was asked to join Operation Oryx by starting a breeding program for the Arabian Oryx, an endangered antelope from the Middle East. We were actually hold, the holders of the world's herd for a number of years, and we were involved in breeding them up so that they could get distributed to other zoos, and then ultimately uh, they were reintroduced back into the wild in 1982. Today, the zoo's conservation efforts are heavily focused on at-risk species that are native to Arizona, like the endangered black-footed ferret and the threatened Chiricahua leopard frog. Working with the Arizona Game and Fish Department, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and other conservation partners, the zoo successfully raises frogs and ferrets that are released into their native Arizona habitats. He's ready to go in his burrow. <laughs> And really our, our goal is to actually start to replenish the population or augment the wild population so that they don't get listed or that they can be removed from the endangered species list. Essentially, we want to go out of business. We hope that that happens soon, but we don't want it to happen too soon. <laughs> There's way too much work to do and far too many local species in dire need of help victims of habitat loss, disease, and competition with non-native predators. They include the Mount Graham red squirrel, the spring snail, and the narrow-headed garter snake. Each one of these species presents a unique set of challenges for researchers at the zoo's conservation and science center. You go into these, what I call little puzzles and challenges, you're not sure if you're gonna have success, the stressful part about it is in many cases, like with the Mount Graham red squirrel, there's only about 250 of them out there. And it's a worry if something goes wrong. But the Phoenix Zoo has an excellent track record when it comes to working with imperiled species. That's why in 2011, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service collected four Mount Graham red squirrels and delivered them to the zoo's conservation center. I came up here at that time and uh, was able to capture two males and two females that um, the, I brought to the Phoenix Zoo just, just sort of like as a hedge, basically. It was an emergency action to protect the squirrel from imminent wildfire and possible extinction. It was a very dry year, so we were really concerned that there was the potential for this mountain to burn and that we would lose, you know, all the habitat for the squirrel. Mount Graham red squirrels are only found in the Pinaleno Mountains of southeastern Arizona, where the highest peak, Mount Graham, rises from the desert floor to an elevation of more than 10,700 feet. So making them feel at home in Phoenix isn't easy. They're kept in a temperature-controlled building that's cooled to a constant 65 degrees. But in our setting, we can't quite get the temperature as cold as, as it is in Mount Graham. In this setting, we have to compensate a little bit by reducing their energy intake and, and monitoring their diet. It took some time to figure out how to keep the squirrels alive and at a healthy weight. Now the zoo is developing a pilot breeding program. It's a complex puzzle because Mount Graham red squirrels are solitary and very territorial animals. Plus, the females are receptive to breeding for only about four to eight hours on just one day each year. Our challenge is, is we don't know which day of the year that is, and we don't know which four hour window we have to put them together. Because they're territorial, they, if we do it at the wrong time, they can hurt each other or you know, seriously injure themselves. Today, this female squirrel is meeting a new man who's moving in next door. By confining male squirrels to their nest boxes, it's easy to switch them from one enclosure to the other. Then it's a matter of opening some doors to see if the squirrels will act aggressively or amorously. And we use different tools. We're looking at behavior, interactions that suggest that they're you know, going to be um, compatible. And we also use some science, which is physiology. We look to see whether or not they're in an estrus something called fecal steroid analysis. By monitoring hormone levels, they try to predict when the squirrels will be ready to mate. 
but most of the work is done through careful observation. The squirrels are under video surveillance 24-7, and those videos are scrutinized for any change in behavior that offers a clue about reproductive readiness. So what I'm doing is I'm recording feeding behavior and re-watching recorded um, feeding times with two of our squirrels. If during this arranged rendezvous it looks like the squirrels are in the mood for love, that final barrier between them can be removed. Unfortunately, this introduction did not lead to a love connection, so the search for a breakthrough continues. She got one right there. These puzzles come in all shapes and sizes. The spring snail is currently the tiniest. I counted 116 today on the full count. I guess there's between 175 and 200 snails in here. It may look like an insignificant little creature, but don't let its size fool you. If these species are present in a, water, in a water system, that's a really good sign. Spring snails are hugely important to aquatic ecosystems. They keep the water clean by eating algae and all sorts of organic pollutants. Now, they only live for about a year, so researchers don't have much time to work with a given population just trying to get a better look at its shell whorls to try to determine an exact age class of it. There are about a dozen spring snail species in Arizona and none is doing very well. The three fork spring snail is listed as an endangered species. In 2008 and 2009, the zoo was not able to get them to reproduce in the lab. Then in 2010, it switched to a surrogate species, the page spring snail, which is found in Arizona's Verde Valley. Yep, so there is a page spring snail right there. Because we were working with a, a less endangered species, we had an opportunity to experiment, if you will, or try different things to see if they were working. After experimenting with water chemistry and methods that give the snails a better chance to find each other during breeding season, the zoo is seeing positive results. We've got reproduction, but we don't seem to have thousands of spring snails. So we think there's some things we haven't quite figured out, but the population is maintaining itself now. We'd like it to grow. That alone is a victory, because at the start of this project, nobody knew if it was even possible to keep spring snails alive outside of their natural habitat. On a side note, the page spring snail was a candidate for federal protection in 2015, but thanks to years of conservation and habitat restoration by Game and Fish, the zoo, and other federal and private partners, listing was not necessary. So that's actually really big news. This is a snake that we haven't been able to find for a couple days out here. I have to remark her, but... It was a different story for the narrow-headed garter snake. So we remark them with nail polish just to differentiate them at a quick glance. In 2014, it was listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. They're also all equipped with a chip, um, so we have a reader that we can scan it. It's a fish-eating snake that's found in New Mexico and Arizona, especially in Oak Creek Canyon. This is basically a little slice of their habitat that they would be living in. So these guys, they do all their hunting on their own. You know, they get to move about freely. Um, they're just checked on twice a day for health purposes. Folks at U.S. Fish and Wildlife and Arizona Game and Fish approached us because they were seeing a decline and the numbers of the narrow-headed garter snake in the wild, and they feared that they were going to be listed uh, as endangered. Uh, and they asked if we could start to work out the, the mechanics of, of managing them outside of their natural habitat to see if we could get them to reproduce. The narrow-headed garter snake has been kept in you know, managed settings before, but has never reproduced. Um, which we were able to do that, and that, that's, you know, really exciting. The zoo acquired seven narrow-headed garter snakes in 2007. A few years later, they reached sexual maturity, and the first breeding attempt was observed, but no offspring were produced. After three more years of documented breeding with no offspring, the zoo finally had success in 2014. This is Rhiannon. She's the one who gave birth to uh, our neonate slash July. So she is the mother of all of these little guys in here. The zoo tried something new that year during the winter months when snakes go into brumation, a state of low activity similar to hibernation. People will, will brumate them in a refrigerator, which is what we were doing. 
But we think that, that us having our hands on them and, and doing that forced brewmating was maybe impacting our success in reproduction. So we came up with the idea to, uh, to have them out here and let them brewmate on their own. The Conservation Center built this brumation chamber, a cold, dark place where the snakes could go to brewmate. And sure enough, um, our female Rhiannon, she chose this brumation chamber and we had success that year, so. So these are the offspring of our adult female narrow-headed garter snake. So they're just a little bit over a year old. From a litter or clutch of 20 neonates, 18 snakes survived. So what we do is we take periodic weights and measurements. So we have a metric to see uh, how fast they grow, um, at what point do they reach adult size, and then we do behavioral observations as to see when they'll reach sexual maturity. The male offspring are cared for in this lab, while the females live outside in this temperature-controlled enclosure. This is Manzanita, so he's one of our breeding uh, males. You can see. He's here male. because he's not related to any of the other snakes, but hopefully he'll father some in the near future. If he does, that could mean the researchers have finally solved another complicated puzzle. But the true test of success is raising animals that can be successfully returned to the wild. Some things we can't do that have been historically done for managing am animals that are going to remain, you know, in a zoo setting. Uh, for example, feeding an animal at the same time every day. We can't do that with the animals we work with here because that would inherently affect their ability to survive if they're, if they're be becoming accustomed to getting food at a predictable time or having their food in a, in a presented to them in a way that they don't have to open it up like a pine cone, which is Mount Graham Red Squirrels have to know how to tear into a pine cone to get the seeds out. If we only give them seeds, they may not know how to do that once they're released to the wild. So we're going to give the squirrels their diet right now. Um, we feed them randomly one, two or three times a day, hide it throughout their enclosure. So we're just trying to simulate some natural foraging habits so they're not just getting all their food in a bowl. It's also important that the animals don't get used to humans, which is why the researchers weigh them without handling them. We have a balance between doing applied studies, applied research here, and not changing the animal's behavior, and applying what we learn towards improving the product, which is animals that have a better chance of surviving once we release them. Meanwhile, the Phoenix Zoo is learning a lot about imperiled species. When we have animals in this setting in hand, we're able to see them doing things that you can't really observe in the field. It's sharing that information with other institutions that are developing breeding programs of their own and with field biologists who can serve and manage endangered species. It's really fantastic that we have such a great relationship with you know, other agencies like Game and Fish um, that many places don't have. And actually being able to work with animals nobody's ever worked with before and gathering all this information for publications for future generations and you know, physically putting animals back on the ground and then monitoring their success. You know? So yeah, it's, um, I find it extremely gratifying to, to be involved in these kind of programs. Much is still not known about the long-term success of these sorts of wildlife recovery efforts, but so far the Phoenix Zoo's Conservation and Science Center seems to be headed in the right direction. We know that a breeding program for release can ultimately result in an animal being stable in the wild. We've done it with their orcs, we've done it with ferrets. We feel like it's happening pretty well with, with the Chiricahua leopard fox and we're pretty confident that, that we have uh, the, the insight and the the tools to do it with the Mock Grand Red School as well. It's a side of the zoo most visitors never see. This commitment to conservation, working hard to keep wild animals in the wild so the day never comes when a zoo is the only place to see them. <laughs>